Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Hope you are all well. Quite a few people in already. Some, some, some over an hour early this time. I think Mike was an hour early. <gasps> Henrik from Aarhus. Hello. Oh, that's cool. Oh, we've got quite a, quite a selection of people in. Give me a sound check, guys. It looks like it's all right, but you know I like to just double check. I have said something. I said, do me a sound check. And then, and then I, oh, I get moaned about this all the time. Whenever we're doing sound checks, I'm, it's the only time that I'm ever quiet. <laughs> it drives Casper mad. Oh, I don't need that one anymore. Hang on. That was from the Emerging Turners last weekend, which was fantastic. Do, do, do. Pick and audio are good. Thank you, Mr. Ash. That's brilliant. Hi, Harvey. I want to say hi to everybody, by the way. So it's been a little bit manic today. I have been out all morning, literally just got back, managed to get turned around, ready for this. We were nearly, nearly, nearly late. But here we are. So we might as well get, get cracking, really. Um, I am going to do a centrifuge piece. Some of you who watched the turn and chill the other weekend, I was having a play with one which didn't go quite right after I went through the bottom of it, which is... Uh, the first time I've gone through the bottom of something, so why not do it live in front of, like, I think there was about 100 people watching. you got to do these things. So today I'm going to do it properly. This is going to be um, in more of a demo format, and then next week it will be back to turn and chill for a couple of weeks. Um, it's going to be a bit all over the place for the next few weeks because I do have some a busy, busy, um, a busy September, so I am not sure what I'm working and etc but anyway you guys don't care about that i'll shut up let's get some wood on the lathe now i'm going to use a piece of beach today <laughs> aurora woodcraft went past roy's day job this morning casper shipping something you're not telling me about <laughs> there we go so yeah we've got a piece of beach today uh, I'm going to have to find the centre line on this. Yes, I am going to have to find the centre. I'm not used to turning square, um, round blanks. I'm used to turning square blanks. So, and they are easy to find the middle of. So, how I find the middle of a round blank when it's not marked is relatively easy. A pair of compasses or a pair of dividers, I absolutely hate those plastic centre finder things they are awful put one point or the point of the pair of compasses where, roughly where you think the middle may be and then extend them out you don't have to go right to the edge but i can see there that that is about 12 mil maybe just more but roughly half an inch on that side and i'm going to check this this side a little bit more than half an inch so i'm just going to sneak that over a tiny bit and then I'm going to check from 90 degrees. So that is slightly less. So I'll move it this way. And that, I would say, is not far off. I don't tend to do diagonals too much, but that is my centre point. It's really, really simple to do, and it's much more accurate and far less confusing. That's my centre point there. It's far less than conf uh, it's far less confusing than using those horrible centre finders. So I've got it on one side. This has been um, rounded off on a bandsaw, um, so it will be, you know, more or less. Um, 90 degrees your blades do wonder but we'll bring that up uh, am i on live chat or talk chat yeah i'm on live chat but someone just said hi to frederick and i can't see him anyway 
No, live okay. chat's okay. live chat's better. Better. Whoa. Oh, Greg's in. You're not late. It's early for you, Greg. So I'm now just gonna roughly give this a bit of a wiggle. That's about right, actually. Just to line that up as best I can. So that is how I centre. John's just asked a question. Let me have a look and see what John's got to say. Because mm -mm -mm. this, all these stupid things are on the screen and I can't see it. Other than turning, have you made projects using grinders and or carving tools? Uh, yeah, I am a, tr a trained, um, well, kind of trained. I've had as much an apprenticeship as you can get at traditional hand carving, and I really like to combine the two things. So, if you want. <laughs> oh, man, I hate this. So, yeah, I do like to combine the two. Um, I have done just carved pieces, I've done just turned pieces, and I've done combinations. Um, but, yeah, I really enjoy um, combining the two. I do the combinations more of um, a texturing thing as opposed to structural or sculptural um, with, with the turnings. So. Casper's just gone to get something to show you. He have not been out for a while. Please excuse me, I am slightly allergic to the cat at the moment. She is um, she's heavily molting and whenever she is I am very allergic so my eyes are watering like mad. Uh, whenever we have you through the car stereo we get a picture of Tina Turner coming up. Oh dear, if anybody had been at the weekender the other weekend, Chestnuts would turn in weekender, you will know that I cannot sing. I give it a shot. You gotta join in these things, but I ain't a singer. Alright, you on bag How's your boy? He does this to me all the time. <laughs> You'll see why. <laughs> oh, this is this is my pride and joy. Uh, to be fair, I need to do something else because I've been trading off Errol for far too long. Uh, this is a carved piece that I did. A few years ago now, and it took a few years to complete. This is Errol, the um, Swamp Dragon from the Discworld novels, as drawn by Paul Kidby. So, I used Paul's drawing as the basic um, pattern for him. And yeah. Show me the collar. There you go. His, co his collar's attached. It's all one piece of wood. It's his favourite bit. <laughs> oh man. There you go. So yeah, you've seen him now, I can put yeah. him away. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I'm super proud of him. I just absolutely hate showing stuff off like that. Thank you. Anyway. Um do I have any favourite carvers? The Heartful Bodger, I really like your name. Um I have my, I, I kind of exist under a bit of a rock, to be dead honest, and um, I don't really know that. I know lots of people, but not many professional people. Does that sound weird? Um, the guy who taught me was Master Carver Mike Painter. Um, he does have a website. He's retired now, sadly, but um, he's a phenomenal carver. Um, so definitely have a look at um, look at his work at the moment for fun. He's, car he's carving Michelangelo's Last Judgment, which is um, the back wall of the Sistine Chapel. Um, naked, yeah, and he's doing it as it was painted originally, with mo the majority of the figures nude, and it's awesome. It is... At <sighs> yeah, I don't think there's any pictures of that on his website, but he is fantastic. And I think... I mean, he might have a Facebook page, but he doesn't really do social media. So... Um, yeah, I am a Jill of all trades, definitely. <laughs> um, you did really well with the carving um, at the week at uh, the other week, Frederick. You and Benny were both good. Ooh, maybe um, I don't know how to say that. First time live here, getting back to turning after twenty-seven years away. Well, hey, welcome back to it. Right, I should get something done, really, because I'll just stand and jabber all day. Mm -mm -mm. 
could link her. I will have a I will have a look. There's there's loads of carvers about. I just I am really, really bad at knowing who who people are and what they do and it's nothing to do with ego or pride or anything like that. It is just I just do not have the time. I get magazines, don't read them. All the wood turning magazines I get, I just literally receive them and put them straight into a pile. I don't I just don't have the time. So anyway. Um, no, I have never carved alabaster, but Mike's carved alabaster, and it's it pretty much is the same as wood carving. It's relatively it's relatively soft to carve, I, I think. <laughs> um, great. It's gonna be. It's we're gonna be another. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, sorry, we have to change microphones because I have to have one installed into this hood. Right, yeah, we're going to be doing some kind of platter today. Oh, thank you very much, Steve. That's really cool of you. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to make amends from the last time because it went a little bit wrong. So, we've got a piece of beach. It's about two and a half inches thick, roughly. I've no idea size-wise. Twelve inch, yeah, about twelve inch. So nice and steady. If you just take the wax off, just chew this up. I'm just going to sharpen this. Seems it, it might not be dull. It's just beach is hard. Hang on. Wobbling about on the back of my head. Oh, it's this that's come off. Just hang on a sec, guys. not going well is it? I'm cursed for centrifuge platters it would seem. Oh is that Kiss and Phil? Sneaking the speed up a little bit. There we go, so finishing cut, I'm just going to go from 45 degrees, that's because that's, my bevels are roughly that, good bevel rub, slow traverse,
and then we can see what's going on with the wood. So we've got a little bit of colouring which is very nice. I kind of want to keep that. So I think we'll have that towards the top. So this face is going to be the front face, or the top face should I say. And it'll curve that way. So I'm going to bring the tool rest round. You'll notice I've extended my quill quite a bit so that I can actually get round to that front face. It needs facing off a bit because it is out of true. So let's get that tidied up. A little bit low. I might be able to lift it a, t a tiny bit more under that step centre. Uh, John, I haven't done a basket weave, but I was quite inspired by her. Uh, Collins the other week, Colin Watson, and I think I might have to have a go at doing them. I really fancy having a bash actually. It's just all working it out that uh, stresses me out a little bit. Butter and peanut butter, that is a bold move, Ben. That is a bold move. I'm not sure I could handle the two. Right, straight edge parting tool. Just putting an initial tenon on here to get this into the chuck. You guys know this is my preferred way. It's a bit awkward with a chunky uh, tail stock. you just got to kind of do your best. It'll be a bit of a rocky ride getting this cut right. If you have slightly more fingernail profile burr gouges than I do, you can cut that with your burr gouge instead of relying on a straight edge parting tool, which would definitely make life easier. But we we'll manage. So just clear that area so that you can get your chuck jaws in. And then we can get this into the jaws of the chuck. So that is just an initial tenon. Pop that into the chuck. I try and do it roughly the right size. So between sort of 45-50 mil. Or between 40 and 50 mil for these jaws. But I don't tend to measure it because it's stressful enough trying to get that cut right without having to worry about size. We're going to crush this tenon, it's sacrificial, it's getting turned away, so I uh, get it as close as I can by eye and, and that will do. <laughs> oh dear, Gavin. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad she's got the right idea. It is a weighty bit of wood, is this? Okay, okay. So, now we can clean this underneath up. So this is now the base, this is the bottom. Uh, clean this up, we're going to get another tenon on there. Let's get that out of the way. And uh, start turning, or start shaping the underneath. So I am not sure whether to go for an internal chucking point or an external chucking point on this one yet. Make that decision in a minute. Probably going to go internal because it's a big old bit of wood. So just facing this up. Uh, 
Yeah, we up. Can't hear a word you're saying. Can't you? Oh, I'm sorry. I think this is going to have to be internal. Because I can't be bothered changing the jars. So it's going to be an internal chicken point. What is this? This is 12 inch, isn't it? It's got to be. Ten. Just shows how rubbish a judge I am. Ten inch. So, our chucking point is going to be... Where's my pencil gone? <gasps> I have a little thingy to put my pencil back in and I haven't put it back in. Now I've lost it forever. Ten it is. That's about your size for an... Um, external chucking point which is way too small to actually keep that on there it doesn't balance whatsoever so for an external chucking point you'd kind of have to be going for I don't know maybe three eighths of an inch wider maybe even more actually you want a decent size on a platter like this that's more like it that's getting back to kind of uh, almost thirds yeah but as I say I haven't I haven't got the jaws. I haven't even got those jaws on carriages. So I will do an internal chucking point, slightly in between those two lines, and then you also have the outside bit of an internal chucking point, which will be around this outer line. That should balance it up fairly nicely. I think it needs to be bigger. So as you can probably tell, I do a lot of things by eye. I'm cutting this slightly deeper than it needs to be because I need to make sure that um, the whole foot area that it's going to sit on is slightly concave and I haven't actually done that yet so I'm going to cut a little area here which is going to be decorative get in with a smaller ball gouge let's get a bit more speed up as well so I'm going to round that off make a little button in the middle take that down because otherwise that's going to be proud and it will sit on there and wobble so I this is just a pattern I've, I've kind of done this since I first started turning I always used to try and put some kind of pattern in the middle do be careful if you put in something three dimensional in the middle that there's enough room around there for your jaws to actually fit um, that should be plenty so I'm going to make this slightly concave now it'll lose that line but I'm not too bothered because I'm not sticking to that anyway and all this does is make sure it sits on the widest point and I think that might be about right right so we've got a chucking point just make sure that that is actually slightly dovetailed which it certainly is now and now we can start to shape this Where's Mark heading out? Have a good trip, Mark.
So I'm shaping this with a draw cut mainly. Just because I can stand at a better angle to see the shape that it's taking, which at the moment is awful. But we will get there. Do you know what? I might even, I might put some texture on the beach. Might just do that. I never put texture on the back of platters. But why not, eh? Mm -mm -mm. So, we don't want to overreach with the tool and bring this round a little bit more. It has actually just pulled a little bit of the grain out at the end. It's plucked it slightly, so I need to back off when I'm getting to that area. And I'm going to get roughly an OG shape to begin with. And then pop a little bit couple of areas of interest on here for once because I as I say I don't normally do that. So what I'm thinking of doing is if we have an area of texture about there and then we put our curve in and we have another one at the top, might make that a little bit smaller, there we go. So I'm cutting in, again if you've got fingernail profile gouges for that it will certainly help um, you make that a nicer cut. And then I'm going to start to shape this area further out and possibly stop around there. Take that down a little bit more. So we've kind of got an OG shape but it's a little start and stop and then we'll grab my texturing tool <coughs> that's not my tool bag that one is my tool bag what have I got on here slightly coarser one have a look. Oh, I've got a bit of tear out there, that's a shame. I've got, I can take that down a little bit more, but I need to take that down a little more as well. But we may be changing this anyway. So, let's reset this because we want the speed nice and slow. Nice high pressure. Um, let's go for a bit of an angle. Not bad, we've got a little bit of tear out. This beach is quite dry. Same again on the outside. Not quite enough room there for the cutter. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Just a little bit different. So I'm just going to deal with this problematic area and then I'm going to give this bit of sand. Oop, that's way too low. So you want the speed like 600, between sort of 6, 700, maybe up to 8 for your texturing tools. Don't have them going too quick. Or don't have the wave going too quick because it will uh, give you a very poor result. 
and then if you are somebody who owns a Dremel you can get a Dremel or a little micromotor that's better um, and you can put a little brush on there and you can clean out your texture you, uh, you can clean out your texture a little bit where it's gone a bit fluffy so I'm just having to take the middle down because I've just removed a bit of the height from the foot due to the tear out and I don't want this being proud <coughs> Mr Shepherd, hello I need to I need to look back on where we're at guys and I've lost it with the chat. Right, oh, extraction. So we've got quite a bit of tear out on the end grain with this. It's a bit dry is this beach, so it's tearing out quite a lot. Get right into that detail. It's better. Uh, Gavin, with the small texturing tools, you can get quite fine texture. It all depends on the pitch that you um, hold the tool at, the speed, and uh, which wheel you use. Um, it has got a fine wheel as the small texturing kit. It comes with the. Oh, that's still torn out. It comes with a really fine one, so it's not it, not bad. But that is a shame when it does that on end grain. It's not so bad at the top here, but it's and it's not so bad on that bit of end grain. But that must be just a little bit softer. And interestingly, that's the area we've still got a bit of problematic grain. If it isn't out now, it's going to stay. That'll do. Right, where's my sanding sealer? There we go. I've lost my tack clock. No, I haven't. I found it. I put it in here, didn't I? Do do it. I thought I had. But I have found my little lining brush, so that can just help tidy up a little bit of that problematic grain. It won't magically solve all of the problems it's causing, but it can just get a little bit of that fluffiness off oh thank you let's get some of this out i forgot to charge my compressor so but to be fair i do always go over it with the tack cloth anyway because it just picks up all that dust instead of putting it back in the environment for it to settle again Oh, 
Now, for some of you normally just very, very boring backs of platters, I actually really like that. Uh, have I ever tried turning sea urchins? No, I haven't. Um, I am currently still trying to turn some seashells. They are ridiculously hard. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming he means actual sea urchins for like hanging ornaments, like Cindy Joe's the users. Um, I don't think they'll be particularly hard, you just have to be very gentle with them, but these shells that I have in resin are just mind-blowingly hard. They're blunting my tools constantly. I'm just putting some sanding seal around so it can really get into the grain there. Kind of, kind of half thinking about putting some embellishing wax in there, some gilt cream. What do we think? Shall we put some gilt cream in there? I am not used to working on large pieces of timber. All my stuff recently has been tiny. <laughs> and this is exhausting. Come on, Sam and Sealer, get on there. Right. Shells in resin, yeah, it's so weird, Jen, somewhere. It's just every time it touches the shell. It, I did this for, I think it was Sarasota wood turners. And, um, yeah, it, it just, it, all it's done, I'm just taking that little t tip of this one off here. And as soon as it touches it, that's it, tool's blunt. Got to sharpen it again. So you kind of sharpen in every cut. And it's, it's going to take a long time. It's, um, I once did some, oh, those, ages ago I did a demo with, um, I made those little, those, um, Fairyland paperweights, which I really enjoyed making, but I put Swarovski crystals in them, and they are glass, so as soon as you touch the glass, bang, sharpen the tool, over and over again, it gets a little bit repetitive when you are, sharpening three or four tools and then taking a cut with each of them as much as you can using every single part of the edge and then sharpening them all again but I will get that platter finished because I think it's going to look cool so sanding seal is soaked in nicely if I'm going to do embellishing wax in the grain I don't really want to use the true bit in there so I'm going to keep to the middle area and denib that and try and stay away from the textured bit because otherwise I'm just going to fill the texture with the true grit. I've never done water drop effects, John. Uh, have a look at Wayne the Woodturner. Wayne's done some amazing water drop effects stuff. Right, so let's work this. Oh yeah, Martin, I'm they're, they're only up for about a week because I'm trying to do proper videos and we're doing a lot of work behind the scenes to get Team Tiny launched. It was going to be, we were hoping to do it for September, but I think we're probably just going to leave it now until next year for Team Tiny relaunch, so that we've got loads of content 
Um, but there will be some sort of bits and pieces that's available on the general channel as well. We might we might get it done before, but Ooh. what colour, guys? What colour shall we do with the embellishing wax? I'm liking that. Oh, I, I haven't. I really don't have a favourite wood. I genuinely do it because every single wood offers something different. So it's like I really don't enjoy turning sycamore, but it's wonderful for putting colour on, whether it's dyes and stains, or if it's paint, or if it's airbrushing. So it's really difficult to say but yeah ash that brings its own things to the table uh, when you've got a beautiful piece of olive ash that's gorgeous you can embellish the grain with ash it's nice to actually cut and work with it sands well beach I, I i'm on the fence with beach a little bit it can be all right to carve i think i have ptsd for the project that i did when i was like 16 in school and I did this award platter for all the projects and I hand carved the lettering around the edge. Bear in mind I didn't actually have any hand carving chisels so I used chip carving knives and it took me hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to carve this lettering because if anybody has never carved beach, well it's pretty much like carving concrete and that is no joke, it is so difficult to work with and ever since then i haven't liked beach but it's such it is a nice timber and again it takes a paint very well it's very warm timber this is micro crystal wax by the way guys i'm just putting a, a top coat on here okay so timbers i hate turning i absolutely hate beyond hate turning lime it gets on my chest, it makes me ill, sometimes sycamore does as well. Um, I struggle to get a good finish turning lime, and yet Gary Lowe can just get the most wonderful finishes and stuff with lime. But yes, yeah, amazing to carve. Um, I like working with you, I like working with walnut, but I'm fussy with walnut, it's got to be fancy walnut, otherwise it's a bit boring. <laughs> yeah, I am very much on the fence. I think I'm going to put, I don't really want to put copper on there because it's too coppery, so what have we got? Oh, we've got gold. Let's put some gold on it. I'm just going to give, I'm just trying to get, there's bits of uh, cloth on there, safety cloth that I'm just trying to get off. trying to not scratch the area that I've put the finish on. I've just caught the safety cloth on some of the texture and it's pulled it away. Oh, you got some stencils, Martin. Nice one. Oh, my goat cream's gone rock hard. Let me find another one. <laughs> I have many on the go. Nope, that's copper. That's gold. That's got a bit of mould on it, just don't worry about that. Let's not pay attention to that. don't like that that's coming off sometimes sometimes we make poor decisions don't like that at all I think that looks manky out comes the lemon oil uh, I can't do raindrop effects on it John because I do not have enough spray paints I have got an airbrush but that it just take a while. I'm doing centrifuge anyway on it. I'm just getting that off with some lemon oil. There might be the odd remnant, but 
I just don't like it a little bit. Sometimes you put colour on and you realise you are just doing it for the sake of putting colour on and that was one of those instances. I actually like the texture on its own. So it will have got onto the microcrystalline wax a little bit with this but I can finish that and buff it off the wave. Yeah, I'm very glad that I've made that decision. You turn. Pardon? Yeah. Turn it round. This is open on expansion. <clears throat> I Steve don't know what colour I'm using yet. Not that it will it'd be interesting to know what kind of colour it appears to be from you. Um, Steve, um, I am sure that he doesn't mind me saying this because he does always put this in chat anyway. But Steve who's my channel moderator as he got promoted the other week <laughs> and then Steve is colour blind and it always fascinates me to know how things appear to people who can't see things the same way that we see them so yeah I'm, I'm interested I'm interested I am um, thinking I, I always go down the purple route and I did green and I think I'm going to go down more of a reddish route today but I don't know is the true answer Right, so we want to put a bit of a curve on this. This is very thick, so I have taken a leaf out of Stuart Farina's book with the whole idea of not turning everything onto the floor. So I am going to put a curve on here. We're going to do the colouring, but it's not going to be the final thing that this piece of wood will ever see because I'm going to have to turn down nearly an inch of wood and wood is getting far too expensive and far too difficult to get hold of these days to just turn into sawdust for the sake of it so when you are doing centrifuge work I tend to go for about 50-50 split so if you were to draw a line down the middle 50% of this is going to be a bowl area, 50% of this more or less is going to be the uh, the outside area of the platter. They're always going a little bit further, we're not going to turn the middle away just yet. So always going a tiny bit further. So you've got room to work with the colour. So um, the high spot, I'm just going to do a very gentle draw cut, more of a scraping cut from that high spot back so that I'm cutting with the grain because you can really tear your grain out going from the outside edge in uphill and then from the high spot with a bit of bounce going on down to there that's square, that one square better. Let's have a look for tear out. We have escaped it. It's really really red beach is this. It's really nice. So we'll give this a sand and then I'm going to put some sanding sealer on there. Some spray sanding sealer. Let that dry. Be a bit ebonizing lacquer and then I'll catch up with a chat while the ebonizing lacquer is drying. How about that? Right, Thank you. 
Ahí está mi niño. Mira. Oh, I'll show you um, a platter I have been working on, Martin. I started this at the Chestnut Weekender. And that's got butterflies on it and I'm very, very pleased with how it's turned out. So, bit of tack cloth, get rid of all your dust before you start spraying on sanding sealers. I tend to go for a spray on sanding sealer when I'm using an ebonizing lacquer just because you're not dealing with um, brush marks and then putting a spray on top. It just gives you a much better, a much better co co coverage. Where's me? Sanding sealer. There you are. Ben, I did get more bales, I just haven't cut them up yet. I think I spent like 400 quid or something, didn't I? No, I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I keep thinking about whether to stick some Nescafe in yours. I have to say, like, I have wondered that. Well, what am I doing? That's ebonizing like I didn't want that. I want a sanding sealer. Read the tin, Emma. Read the tin. Here, yeah, I'll give you that. I'm going to try a different lacquer today, a different ebonizing lacquer. Because there is a reason why. I'm currently trying out various different ebonizing lacquers. Because sometimes, um, if you do too good a job <laughs> at applying them, you end up with um, a bit of a shiny surface. And it can repel uh, the two products that we put on next, which causes problems. So my usual go-to has always been chestnut ebonizing lacquer. And this one is uh, satin lacquer. You can finish it and build it up to a gloss. But I have recently got a Hampshire sheet, which, which one is that one? I've got a Hampshire sheet satin lacquer. And I've got a gloss lacquer as well that Martin does. So I'm kind of trying to try them all to see which one might work better for this particular application. It might be a case of they all are the same and I might have to start keying the surface, which I really don't want to do. Um, so right, if you do a bit of a shabby job applying them, but we don't want to do that. That's not, that's not an excuse. So I'm just going to denip this. Yeah, that definitely needs it. Ooh! That sounds good, Lucy. I don't think we're going to the Andals this time, by the way, guys. Um, we normally do the markets. I don't think we're going to be able to go in September. Ooh, that's nice and smooth. So that's just Dinobs with some 320 grit. Let's go for the satin. Let's go for the satin. Right, I'm going to take this off here because I am messy. Mm. 
spray thingy. John, not not a great deal really, apart from um, Yorkshire Grit's no longer made in Yorkshire anymore. Mm, um, so as a Yorkshire person, <laughs> um, unfortunately pride does, um, ha it, it does have to be considered. Um, and True Grit is made just down the road from me, like 20 minutes away. They do the same thing, so does Chestnut Cut and Polish, they are abrasive pastes. Um, the only difference with them, the Yorkshire Grit and the True Grit, those are classed as inert. They don't have flashing agents in to um, dry them or cure them quickly. Cut and Polish does, so that one is kind of ready quite quickly. Um, the others, I found that you could, if you can leave them a little bit before you put your next coat on, it does help a little bit with bonding, but you can, uh, yeah, you, so, you sometimes need to... Uh, Oh, that's different. So that is applying in a line, which I can't get used to. Right, this requires orientation of your hand arm piece of work because it sprays out in a line as opposed to not. The chestnut one just comes out more of a circular pattern, this is a line. It will definitely need two coats from what I'm seeing here, which is fine, that's usual. So I'm going to put this out of the way, catch up on the chat, come back to this in a little while. We just drop loads of sawdust over it, which I always end up doing. Great. Oh, let me just pick these bits off. That's because I went over it and everything fell off. I'm not good at lacquering, can you tell? There's reasons why I stay away from it. That is a potent lacquer. I'm going to open the door. Whew. I haven't got my gas filters on this. Yeah, you can use car paints. I don't really know a lot about the makeup difference wise um, I probably wouldn't airbrush the gesso because it's got um, an, an abrasive tooth to it I'm not sure you'd be able to thin it enough to get it through an airbrush to be honest Gavin mm, let's have a look right I'm going to have a catch up John what new inspirations have I been getting I don't really I, I find inspiration a difficult word to deal with. Um, <laughs> if anybody read that magazine article, I had a bit of a mini rant about it. Um, honestly, I literally never get to go anywhere apart from demos and stuff, and um, much to um, our disappointment, so don't really get to museums and things like that. I might go out for the odd day, but a lot of it just comes from my head and playing. That's where I get my ideas from, not... A lot of people might go out and see things and think, oh, I'd love to try and recreate that and stuff, but I I genuinely don't have the time to do that, so it just is from playing and experimenting. Um, I had a really fun weekend not that long ago with the guys from Trent Valley Wood Turners, and that was kind of an experiment day where we just chucked loads of stuff on the lathe and just went through the creative process. So that was good, but... Yeah. Oh, really wish I hadn't went over that. Anyway, I did go back in time now. And this is one good thing about it not being the finished piece, because it's going to be um, done again. So, the high spots, we've got quite a good coverage on. <laughs> oh, Alex. 
the uh, those airbrushes are really cool and I've be recently been buying different airbrushes to try the actual airbrush out the little airbrush compressor on the website is cool and I've just got some back in stock so I have ruined this slightly due to leaning over it I think this is going to need three coats. Sometimes beach can be a bit thirsty and it's making this have a bit of a patchy application. So we'll need to do a third coat, I'm afraid. What do we? For the purpose of the demo? Nah. Be fine. So, I'm going to move this again, but I won't lean over it. Blimey, it stinks, does that? I hate lacquers. I'm just trying to catch up on the chat. Oh, Gideon's going to be five on Friday. Goodness me, that's so big. Five years old. Happy birthday, Gideon, for Friday. There you go. Um, yeah, you, I think you might be able to turn the nozzle. And I, I know that he's done that for using it on the lathe, but I am pants at finishing with lacquers, so doing it on the lathe is not a, not a possibility. No, you can't turn it. It's no problem. It's no problem. Right. Oh, I'll show you my, um, my platter. I've still got to take part of the cover off it. I made butterflies! Ta -da. So this is a combination of, this is um, chestnut spirit stains, it's some Hampshire Sheen carnival colours and some tiny turner finishes, there we go. So tiny turner chameleon colours. So that's my, that's my rainbow platter, uh, no it's not a rainbow, it's a butterfly platter so far, but I kind of think I need to do something else on it and I don't know what so it's kind of paused at the moment yeah so we're getting there we're getting there but I really like I like the chameleon colours giving a bit of sparkle that's what I started at the wood turning weekender I just didn't actually do any did I do any of this airbrushing while I was there? I don't think I did Right, let's get this underway. It's still a bit sticky. Hello, Wayne. No, Martin, I'm not at Yandel's in um, September, I'm afraid. And John, uh, no, it's not kiln dried. Most of I, what I use is air dried, but it's just very, very air dried and air dried very well. It's really nice stuff. Mm. Oh. I'll have to bear with us a minute, it bumps. Whew. I need some. Do you want pardon? Yeah, change mics for a minute. I'll take this off for now. Where's my drink? So I'm just going to stick my glasses on for doing the centrifuge bit, and I'm I'm going to it's the the respirators are brilliant, but sometimes uh, normally I would have my gas filters on for spraying that amount of lacquer, and I just didn't think to change them. And once it's in there, it's pulling it through the filters. It kind of sits in the filters a bit, so it, it stinks.
Oh dear, Lucy. One of our little people's uh, bigger than me now. But it's not that much of an achievement, to be fair. It's not that difficult to get to four foot ten and a half. Right, we'll put some of that on. Let's get my brushes ready. Let's get my glasses on. Still a little bit tacky. I think I could have possibly put done to have put a bit more sanding sealer on there because it's not dried brilliantly, but it doesn't it doesn't matter for the purposes of the demo. Um, mixing pot. I'm a bit all over the place because I had to take so much stuff with me the last few weeks that I don't know where it is. Is there? Sorry guys. I'm going to use red iridescent from Joe Sonia as the base coat. I don't often use the red one so it'd be nice to give that a shot and then we'll go on to... I might use some of the ethereal colours on this then. That'll do. No, it's fine. Okay. It'll go over. I'll just dry it off with some tissue. Thank you. I only need one clean one. So, I'm going to go for 50-50 mix. Flow medium and paint. So, it's kind of heavy cream consistency, double cream consistency. I'm not sure I'll have enough there. And then I'm going to put quite a, a good amount down because I'm going to try and get this flared out a lot so it covers that slightly patchiness of the ebonising lacquer. Like I say, don't ever go on how well products work by how I use them because I am not big into it. all sorts of different finishes, especially lacquers. I am not good with lacquers. Pardon? I have. You were here. You snooze, you lose, Casper. So, yeah, red iridescent. This is for Casper, okay? So it's red iridescent dress on your paint. 50-50 mix or one to one depending on how you like to figure your ratios out with flow medium there we go Do -do. you can buy these in individual bottles you can buy them in a pack or you can buy them in a trial pack which is um, the least expensive way of doing it is the trial pack and a small bottle of the flow medium because these guys are from America and they ain't cheap anymore due to import costs and shipping costs and everything but they are wonderful paints so we want to get this sped up to speed i'm not bothered about me being protected but i am bothered about the camera and the lathe being covered you want a decent speed on this i just got that in my face and all in my hair because i was leaning over about 2000 rpm this is 1700, it should be all right. Oh. So, it's not quite thrown it out quite as much as I'd have liked, but that is a combination of the volume of paint I used. I wasn't sure that there was quite enough. Um, and, yeah, all of them in my hair. <laughs> right. I am going to grab a hairdryer. Now, this might pull, uh, cause a little bit of an issue with the lacquer because the lacquer is not fully dry. But it will dry off the... Um, it will dry off the paint. 
I might go for oranges on. Oh, no, I know what colour I never use. That's the colour I'm going to use. I'm going to use one of the new ethereal colours, which is Starlight, and it's um, it's kind of a yellowy gold. So this will brighten as we dry off the carrier fluid. So that gives it, it's kind of more a sort of salmony colour, um, is the Joe Sonia Red. It's like a salmony pink almost. It's not the worst colour, but that is our background. So I like it flared out. I really like that effect as a background. It just adds a little bit of something to it. I'm now going to put some size on here. So this is just polyvine acrylic size. Um, a lot of you guys will already be very familiar with this because I sell this with kits for the chameleon powders and the ethereal powders and flakes etc. So this is on my website. Um, the Joe Sonia stuff is as well. Um, I don't currently have any of the Hampshire Sheen um, ebonizing lacquers because I am just trying those out for the first time but i do have the chestnut one which is my usual one that i use um so i've got that in stock and the joe sonia paints so this is just a bigger bottle of the same size that i have on the site and i'm just gonna go around here i don't want to put as much of the size on as we had with the paint because we don't want it quite flaring out that same amount I'm not you'll notice that I'm not painting any of this on with it on the lathe and the reason for that is I have had disasters trying to do that before if you make your consistency slightly too runny with the Joe Sonia stuff and then you put it onto the lathe uh, or you're putting it on sorry when it's on there it can run down the platter and that's the platter spoiled you've got to then take it right back to um, the ebonizing uh, sorry you've got to take it right back through the ebonizing lacquer so you can start that again I can't hold that like that Try not to put fingerprints on because if you put fingerprints into your lacquer the powders that we put on next will pick up the fingerprints right this time i am not going to lean across so just give it time to throw all that out Now you won't really see much going on with the size, which is normal. So we'll take that off. As I say, I much prefer to work on these taken off the lathe. Just be careful when you are taking it on and off. And the reason I don't put the powders on is because a lot of it will drop to the floor or onto your lathe bed. So I kind of like to work straight, straight down. So I'm going to go with Supernova, which is a kind of a red colour shift, and then I'm going to do Starlight second. So I'm going to do a repeat. Do what? What are they? These are the ethereal pigments, so they do have a colour shift to them, but these are white-based instead of the ones that are called the chameleon pigments on the website. Um, so this one's a really kind of vibrant orange. So it should work with that red. Making sure that the size is completely dry. And we know that because it goes clear and it kind of looks a little bit like varnish. And I'm gonna, I think I'm going to like this colour combination. I never do oranges, even though I love the colour orange. 
and uh, not a lot of people know that because I'm kind of known for my affinity for purples but I love the colour orange and I never <laughs> ever do anything orange but that, this one's a really nice kind of red to orange colour shift so it complements that red iridescent paint of the Josonia range So that is pretty much covered, I think. Those are those bits of wood that I got stuck onto the lacquer. So at this stage, you want to make sure that everything is where you want it to be. And what I mean by that is if there's any bits of powder lurking that you haven't brushed off properly, get rid of it because we're going to seal this in now. We're going to use um, some lacquer and we just... Oh, this is cat hair. It's a bit of Luna in, in, involved in this creative process. So yeah, we're going to fix all this or seal this in with some lacquer. Um, I tend to just use either acrylic gloss or melamine gloss lacquer. I'm not lacquering it as such, it is just to fix. So I tend to hold it about 20, 30 centimetres away, about a foot away. And just lightly go over that surface. And then we can put a second coat of the size, which you don't have to do. Um, I like to do a couple of colours. Sometimes it can make it look a bit busy, um, so I don't always do it. But on this occasion, because we're going to go for a very bright gold powder on the top, I think it will work. Oh, so Steve, you can see, <laughs> holy moopo, you can see it. So you can see that, that actually looks, you can see a colour shift in it. That's pretty cool, Steve. I like, I'm, I, I'm, it's all fascinating to me is all this. Hmm. So I've tried to put a little bit less of size on this time. Word of warning, try and rinse your brushes off relatively quickly from the size. It is water-based. It does wash off. It's supposed to wash off with water. And, and I, I always say this to people, and yeah, 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 it washes off with water. Whenever I've tried to wash it off with water, it never really seems to come off. I use a lot of just on your brush soap. Um, I love that stuff. Um, but if you let the size dry completely, on your brushes it's really really hard work to get off so once I've used the brush um, I do try and clean it so that'll be the first thing I do when I go in a lot of my brushes suffer when I'm at demos I have to admit but these things happen <laughs> great can we start from the beginning yes yeah, sure no problem Oh, we got up to 80. Hi, DJ. I'm sorry that I haven't said hello to loads of people. So this is Starlight. This one's kind of a kind of goldy orange. And I just want this to pick out the last bits. And just add like a top layer of colour. So I didn't put quite as much size on because I didn't want to go over everything that we've done so far. This is just like a final highlight. I am liking this colour combination very much. See, the trouble is, I don't like the green iridescent, um, co the colour of the green in the green iridescent um, of the Joe Sonia. Um... I often find greens are quite horrible <laughs> in paints, generally. They're, they're just very kind of bluey greens, and I like more of a yellowy green. So I have used that one before and put it with some of the green micas, but it doesn't quite work because 
especially the nature of the chameleon pigment in my range is very kind of very grassy green it's a very bright vibrant yellowy green and it doesn't work quite well but this works well with the red works really nicely that's quite something it's always very exciting when you put something together and it does actually work um right so i am actually going to just use a bit of tack cloth to get these last bits off um i have got some quite large brushes that i use for gilding um they're they're gilding mops they're really good for getting excess powders off as well those little brushes are great but sometimes they leave that little bit of residue like there was a bit around there so tack cloth is brilliant because it won't pull it off the size but it will just pick up and hold those last bits and then we can turn the middle out and see what this looks like finished oh so steve that looks like the same as the last color interesting Okay, interesting. Right, guys. Last little bit. Okay. So, I'm not going to put my respirator back on just because I'm not turning a great deal off. I forgot to put the lacquer on. Let's do that. Because that will make dust stick to it. All over the place today. So, again, melamine lacquer before you start turning. Or acrylic gloss. Just make sure it is a gloss. Just fix that into place. If you want at this stage, you can do a full lacquer finish on this. Um, if you are going for a really glossy lacquer, it'll look really nice with the pigments underneath. That just needs a couple of minutes. Just spin it up. Those are the two colours that we've just used. <laughs> Are you not amused? Right, we're good to go. We're good to go. So let's get this middle taken out. It feels very weird. Not. Where's my face shield? I am going to swap. I am going to swap. I, I, it's, it, I do not like turning in glasses anymore. You get so used to turning with a face shield on it. You feel like naked when you're turning without one. So I, I use this, or if I'm at clubs, um, I tend to use my Bolly face shield. Um, it's really good, is that face shield. Are we good? Cool. Right, let's whip the middle out, give it a sand. Now, if you are just practicing, go, don't go too mad hurrying this out because you cut, that's when you come a cropper. That's what happened to me the other week because that platter had been turned and turned and turned. So the middle had got deeper and deeper and deeper and then I parted through it. And don't forget, in this instance, I have a recess instead of a foot. So that also limits us. So I won't be taking this to the depth that it would normally be going to because this has still got life in it and it will be turned again.
So this is now 50-50. Um, I've turned area to cold area. It will not stay like that because I don't particularly I'm gonna make it a tiny bit wider that barrel area. It's not quite 50-50. So watch the placement of your bow gouge as you start that cut. It's really easy for it to skip back. And we don't want that to happen. So even 50-50 I'm not hugely keen on. So I tend to put a little cut into the piece. Um, the reason for that, let's bring that round, is for, well I'll show you in a second, it's for balance. So I add a little V groove into it. You guys that were watching this on the uh, turn and show that I did the other week, did I get to that stage? I'm not sure I did because I made a part of it off. So I'm not going to go through all the grits with this. This will always happen. So the fact that you've lacquered it will help. Um, but it will just wipe off. All it's doing is sticking to the high points. It's not sticking to the size. So go back in with your tack cloth, get rid of all that dust. Put your finish on the middle, whatever you're going to go for. And then I do one last cut, one last little V cut. And it's just to improve the proportions because it puts a little bit of wood into the coloured area and by doing so a little bit of colour into the wooden area and it's much, it looks much better I'll just go to the cutter, um, true grit stage with this in the middle Oh, yeah, Martin, it does change colour through the different camera angles because they are even the ethereal range. I only call it the ethereal range because you can see through it slightly, so they are still chameleon pigments, but they're in a white base. Um, oh, in fact, if you want to see them in resin, the, one of the reasons that I... Oh, I never put those blanks. There they are. One of the reasons that I launched the ethereal range is because you can put them in resin. So you might be able to see that that's green slightly. But I'm not sure what angle I need to tip it to because of the multiple white sources. But at one angle it should go pink as well. Yeah. So that's the tiniest, tiniest amount in the resin. And this one's called Aurora. Yeah. It will work. Try it on the front camera or on the other sides. Yeah, you can see it. You can see it on the front slightly there. You've got a pink and a green transition. There you go. There's the, there's the, there's the pink. There's the green. So, it's pretty cool. This is going to be, I'm really making this into a sphere at some point. So, they work beautifully in resin. The actual chameleon powders, the ones that, have, that look, you can see the colours a lot more easily on them. They've got a black base to them. They don't work so well in resin. They still, you can still get something out of them, but they're just not quite as subtle. They kind of go grey. They have a grey background to them. A grey base. Right, there we go. So one last little bit. So 
So this is what I mean by putting a little bit of the rub it into the colour area and by doing so it does the opposite as well. And we'll put a V-groove about, because this is quite a large platter, about three eighths of an inch from the middle. So we're just using the point of the parting tool. We're going to make it quite wide actually, quite deep, quite wide with it being a bigger platter. And that just helps to bring the two together slightly and finishes it off. And I do that on pretty... We'll go back to the other camera now. Um, yeah. Sorry. Not the other camera. The other microphone. Whew. Yeah, so I do that quite quite regularly, actually, on um, coloured coloured pieces, just because it just brings it together slightly um, and then I'll just get a little bit of oil and I tend to go around that with a bit of oil because the oils especially if it's um, I use quite a lot of Odie's oil um, and that's that doesn't react with the paint but if you're careful with most oils you can just paint it in there so that at least it's got some finish on um, so we've got our, our platter so it is very thick the reason for that is I'm not going to turn it into a pile of shavings so we've got red we've got um sanding sealer we've trialed out some hampshire sheen satin ebonizing lacquer um but i i am used to the chestnut one um so i haven't done the best job at applying this and then we've used the joe sonia red iridescent paint as a background which has created a bit of a flower effect then i've used um the polyvinyl acrylic size and put the colour Supernova from my ethereal range on there. And that is kind of a, 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 a red to orange colour shift. And then we've put, put another layer on and then we've put the colour um, Starlight on there. And that is kind of a gold orange, like an amber to a gold colour shift on there. And then, yeah, it almost looks a bit green from that mm. angle. I suppose there is a bit of green in it actually. There is a bit of green in it. Um, and melamine gloss lacquer between each layer. And the back we've used a texturing tool as well for a change because I always just do an OG and I actually really, really like that. I might have to do that more often. Yeah, it's quite a simple but effective way of doing something on the back. So this will get turned off. The front of this will get turned off a few more times. It will be demoed and used for various things a few more times before it's actually, uh, before it will become its final piece. Um, but I really, really hope that you've enjoyed it. I will put the little link to my website up on there. Most of these products are available on there. You'll just have to have a little bit of a scoot around the shop. I ship worldwide. <clears throat> um, I just can't send anything hazardous out or timber abroad. It's just too much of a nightmare and a headache. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for watching. It's been really great to get back in the saddle and doing a demo. Next weekend it will be a turn and chill weekend, so it's probably just going to be a little bit more relaxed. But I am putting together a demo program for various Sundays randomly throughout the um, rest of the year. And Team Tiny will... If it's not up and running in the next couple of months, we will definitely have it started again for the new year. We are working very, very hard behind the scenes. Um, so, yeah, it's good. Right then, guys. That's the exact colour of your getaway car. <laughs> that would be a cool getaway car, wouldn't it? That would be pretty awesome. But, yeah, thank you very much, guys. Um, I will see you all next Sunday, all being well. Um, there is a contact page on the website if you want to give me a shout about anything. And, um, yeah, I will catch up with you all again soon. Thank you very much for spending your afternoon, morning, evening, whatever time of day it is. Um, yeah, I'll leave you be. Right, enjoy your day, guys. Take care. Bye for now.